Hello, and welcome to our webinar on 3D stereo sensors and vision platforms. Um, you're, oh, we are very happy today that you are all joining us for this webinar, uh, which will be presented by Dr. Heiko Hirschmiller, one of our co-founders. And if you have any questions, please feel free to put them into the chat or the Q&A section. All questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. And now I would like hen to hand over to Heiko. Um, Heiko, the stage is yours. Thank you, Julia. Thanks. So today I would like to um, give you an overview of our hardware, of the sensors that we are um, offering. And um, I would also like to talk a little bit about the background. So what is uh, um, yeah, what is the technology that we are using in our sensors? Um, and um, yeah, give you a little bit insight on that. And I'm very excited that today I can also present a very new sensor to you, the Arcel Wizard Next Generation, which is um, yeah the newest generation that we have, which has some really really cool features that um, yeah somewhere requested for a long time from customers, and um, yeah now we can offer them. But let's give it a start. So first of all, um, yeah sensing technology. Uh, a few slides on that before I come to the products. Um, we are using stereo vision for computing yeah, depth 3D information from images. There are other technologies on the market like time of flight, like structured light and so on. And they all have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, the advantage of stereo is that we can from one instance in time from one image pair, basically, which is taken at one instance in time, we can get the image information and we can get the, uh, calculate the depth information with pretty high resolution. And um, the depth information gives us metric information about the scene, so uh, distances, sizes, and so on. And the camera images, um, yeah, can be used for. Um, applications for uh, for programs that interpret the image for like to do some pick and place tasks and so on, identifying objects. So for example, for machine learning. Um, and these two sources are then perfectly registered with stereo vision and given, um, yeah, from, from basically one instance in time. At the heart of our software, there is an algorithm which is called semi-global matching. That is something that I did, um, or yeah, I developed in my research time at the German Aerospace Center um, quite long ago. 2005 was the first publication, but this um, algorithm became quite famous. I yeah received a lots of awards, as you can see um, on the slide here from from different organizations. Um, SGM became actually the gold standard in aerial and satellite image processing for computing 3D city models, landscapes, and so on. And as a totally different application, it's also, it was picked up by Daimler, the car manufacturer in Germany, for their so-called 60 vision system, uh, which they use for driver assistance. So um, it's on the market for, for many, many years in not only Mercedes cars anymore, but when you see a car on the street with not just one camera yeah, near the rear mirror of the windscreen, but two cameras, then you know that SGM is actually running inside. And we are using this algorithm, which has a very wide application range. We are using it for robotics mostly, and that's what is implemented in our sensors. Only one slide. Uh, for some of you which are interested in that, um, about um, what makes SGM so special. So first of all, it's a classical image processing algorithm. At Roboception, we have both. We are working on classical image processing algorithms and machine learning, because we see that both have their yeah, advantages and disadvantages. And um, the combination of both or the, uh, so for some, this uh, classical algorithm is better and for some machine learning algorithms is better. That's basically what I want to say. So SGM is a classical algorithm. It's based on the idea of having a global cost function. So global over the whole image, 
which connects all pixels to each other and which provides a cost. How much does it cost to map the left and the right image of the cameras to each other? Um, so basically, with this cost function, we can evaluate um, if a depth or disparity image, um, how well does it fit yeah, to these images, uh, to the left and the right camera image. You see the formula here on the slide, but don't worry, I'm not going into depth. Um, just saying that this is a this is the formula that SGM uses, and um, it turns out that uh, mathematically, actually solving this formula for two-dimensional images is an NP-complete problem. So it means it cannot be realistically solved. You cannot realistically find the minimum of that function. What SGM does is it finds a very very good approximation by computing that function along one-dimensional paths in the image. So in SGM, as you've seen, um, as it's shown here in this uh, image, we are going along one-dimensional passes in eight directions towards each pixel, computing this function, and then summarizing it, searching the minimum, and so on. And it turns out that by doing this, um, many, many calculations can be reused and that they can be implemented very, very efficiently. Um, so, and that's why it is semi-global, yeah? Global because the cost function is global and semi because it's not, yeah, we are going just one dimen in one dimensional passes. Um, we are using as a matching cost um, census. So the stereo matching cost basically decides um, how um, parts of the left image are compared to, to the yeah, corresponding parts in the right image. And we are using census as a matching cost um, that was published by um, yeah, Woodfield and Zabi some time ago. And it turns out that it fits very well to SGM. And it is also at the same time very robust against radiometric differences. So radiometric differences mean that the same corresponding point appears um, yeah, brighter or, or less bright in the camera image, in the left and right camera images. And this comes from, first of all, imperfections of the camera, but also from scene properties, because um, the reflectivity of, of, of uh, surfaces uh, changes when you change the viewpoint from the left to the right camera. So um, you need a matching cost which can compensate that. And um, yeah, we are using sensors for that. In the end, SGM has a very good runtime quality trade-off, so means that we can nowadays run SGM um, with yeah, pretty good frame rates, even on embedded hardware. And at the same time, you get a pretty good quality. So um, that is what it makes so attractive. And also, it is um, it can very well implement it, um, for example, in CUDA um, on, the, um, yeah, on the GPU. Yeah. Um, there are many re-implementations of SGM because it's a published algorithm, so everybody can re-implement it. But um, yeah, we want the results differ a lot because many people just implement a few ideas from SGM and then call it SGM. But yeah, it's not uh, it's not the same. So I would like to especially mention SGBM, a semi-global block matching from OpenCV, which as I said, uses some ideas from SGM, but they have taken a few shortcuts that I would not have taken in that way. Um, so um, it's not the same result as uh, we are providing here. So that is a published algorithm. After founding Roboception about eight years ago, um, I worked further on um, yeah, semi-global matching and um, tried to improve it. And here are just a few obvious improvements that um, we did in that time. So first of all, we are providing for each and every pixel, for each and every measurement in the, in the disparity image, we are also providing a confidence. The confidence is a probability that the pixel measurement is an inlier. So basically saying that the pixel measurement is correct. Um, and this computation was then also evaluated against um, databases with ground truths like Middlebury and so on. And um, yeah, we found out statistically, I can also, if anybody is interested with that, uh, in, into that, I can provide some more statistical data um, that we can show that um, 
what we are providing here is a confidence can statistically actually be seen as a, uh, as a probability that the pixel is correct. So all the white pixels here in this confidence image that you see here on the right side um, have a very, very high confidence of almost 100%. And they are basically all correct. Um, pixels which are here marked in gray, the, there, there the algorithm is not that sure. That's basically because we have here white background. We have here repetitive texture in the background. There, stereo vision is not that 100% sure. As you can see here in the disparity image on the left, it still it looks pretty OK, pretty good, the, um, the depths. But the algorithm warns you, hey, I'm not 100% sure. And we are using this confidence information a lot in the software modules that we are providing, this pick and place modules, um, for yeah, just evaluating what we can trust and how much trust we can put into, into the measurements. Secondly, um, we have also worked on subpixel interpolation to, to tune that to how SGM works and also how the census matching cost works. So what does subpixel interpolation mean? Um, in stereo vision, you measure basically pixel wise. So you, you, you try to find the correspondences from the left and right image uh, pixel by pixel in pixel steps, basically. And these pixel steps in the reconstruction, they look like uh, um, yeah, depth steps if you do not do any subpixel measurements or, or interpolations. And um, yeah, we've we imp imp implemented here a method which um, pretty much smooths all of that out. I will show you in a minute um, an example where you can see that you basically do not see any disparity uh, steps anymore. And finally, um, we worked on advanced smoothing. So smoothing the disparity image in the end is also quite important because, um, yeah, due to several sources, you have a little bit noise in and so on and so on. And um, quite often, we also want to have um, surface normals. And for computing them, probably you, you need a smooth uh, um, uh, yeah, disparity image. And we implemented here also an approach which is based on global energy minimization. Um, and this approach is special because it um, maintains all depth discontinuities. It does not over smooth over any uh, uh, depth steps, yeah, which exist in reality. So um, this method is um, using also the confidence information for weighting. It also uh, gives us here a little bit of boost, and um, yeah, and that's. Basically, the reason why we cannot only provide a point cloud, we can also provide a mesh that can be untexturedly shaded and gives a very good quality. So, um, yeah, I will show you this live. That looks maybe a bit better. So that's basically a, a, yeah, a snapshot um, that I took yesterday from just some objects uh, on a table. Um, so this is now textured. I can switch off the texture here. And what you have here is a pretty clean result where you do not see any, uh, yeah, any depth steps really on the also on the slanted surfaces. You do not see uh, stepwise the disparities um, and so on. And um, this is a shaded mesh. This is not a, a point cloud anymore. Um, normally, when you try to visualize raw stereo data, it looks very very noisy. But we can visualize it in this way because our data is really clean. Um, also, when you look at that um, from the side, um, let me just change the background color, then it's bit, a little bit better visible. When you look here at the table nah, from the side, you can see here almost no real bumps. Yeah? The bumps that you see here, they are just from shading. So the shading in the mesh, uh, it increases uh, the impression that you have from the um, yeah from the roughness, but uh, in total, um, I think these results are very very clean actually. So getting back to the slides, um, one more thing because before um, I show the products, I'm often asked what is the accuracy of our sensors of our method and so on. So the accuracy um, has actually. Yeah, there, there are two things to say about that. 
first of all, we have a calibration accuracy. Yeah, we need to calibrate the left, right to the camera. We need to calibrate the lens distortion, which is always there in, in uh, real, real lenses. And we have um, actually a patented method. So we have a patent on that uh, to ensure high calibration quality, to ensure that the calibration quality is always the same. And the typical calibration error that we have is about one, uh, 0.1 and 0.2 pixels, which is pretty low. And that has been tested over many, many sensors with many distances and so on. So that is a that is the error which comes from calibration and which is still there in the data. Next, um, the next thing is, um, yeah, what is the accuracy of, of the stereo matching algorithm itself? And there, that's basically, um, what is the depth resolution that the, that the, uh, um, the stereo matching method can see in the data. Um, and for that, uh, we did a lot of experiments with um, very, with well-defined, very thin metal plates. So in steps of, uh, I think, 0 0.1 millimeter, we had, we had uh, thin metal, which we put on a, yeah, on a piece of wood. That's what you see here on the left side. So that is a, a reconstruction where we have a piece of wood. You do not see that it's wood, but it is. And we have here um, the three uh, pieces of metal, which you can actually, in the depth data, you can see it. And that you can see it means that it is above the resolution of the algorithm. And while trying out this with many different distances, with different sensors, with different baselines and lenses and so on, um, we found empirically out that with our method, with SGM, with all of that was I just explained, smoothing and so on, we have um, a resolution of about one sixteenth of a pixel. That is what we can actually see in the, in the depth data as depth differences. And when we combine both the resolution and the accuracy, which comes from calibration, um, we come realistically to an accuracy of about a quarter of a pixel in the image. And when you have that value, I mean, that measurement in the image, you can then calculate what does it mean in certain distances. So for stereo matching um, or for stereo vision, since stereo vision is, uh, um, yeah, stereo is a triangulation measurement, um, it is like this that um, in, in double the distance, the error increases by factor four. So it's it's squared to the um, to the distance. And um, yeah, while taking these numbers here, this quarter pixel, we can then see that, um, for example, yeah, this 160 uh, M-6 uh, um, RC wizard has in one meter distance, yeah, about one millimeter accuracy. Of course, in higher distances, as I just explained, goes up. So that is how we come to the numbers that you see in our tables for different sensors and so on. And um, the method with which we, with which we uh, got these numbers um, shows you that, um, yeah, we trust in um, in this in these numbers that we provide here. So that was a little bit about the background of the technology. Now I'm showing you the products that we have. So this slides gives a little bit an overview. We have um, the so-called RC Wizard sensor family, which consists of um, yeah sensors which with onboard processing, where we can compute the depths and also um, other stuff directly on the sensor. We have um, an RC cube, which I also explain in a minute, which um, can run um, software. And we have um, a high resolution sensor, which is called RC Core. And we also have a random dot projector. I will explain all of that on the next slides. I'm not going to talk today about the software module. So we have a lot of software modules for pick and place tasks for robotics, but this is explained in other videos in other webinars. So the RC Wizard um, sensor family um, consists of five different sensors. Four of them you can see here. Um, so basically we have two different baselines. The small sensor here, is useful if you need to go very close to an object. So you can measure from 20 centimeters onwards. 
while with a wider baseline here, you have to be at least 50 centimeters away. So it cannot measure closer than, than 50 centimeters. Um, and we have both in color and in monochrome. And the fifth one is actually this one here, uh, the 160M with a different lens. So with a lens, which is a little bit smaller field of view, because we found out that for many customers which do uh, pick and place tasks, they need to mount the sensor a little bit further away so that they can get with a robot in between. And uh, it actually a smaller field of view was beneficial. So we are providing that as well. One word maybe about uh, color and monochrome. Uh, both cost the same money. Yeah, color sensor, uh, the color version and the monochrome version is the same uh, in terms of, of price. And then customers often say, yeah, if it's the same, uh, then I take the color version. I would not recommend that always. Yeah, the disadvantage of color is that a color sensor is less light sensitive, about factor three times less light sensitive than color uh, than uh, uh, yeah color is a color sensor than monochrome and also the resolution is a little bit less because in a color sensor you have a buyer pattern and yeah due to all of that technology um, a color sensor is a little bit blurred the image tiny little bit and it's three times less light sensitive which can make a difference in an application. So I would always give the recommendation, if you do not need color, if you if you know that you need color, of course, then you can buy it. But if you if you are unsure, then rather go for the monochrome sensor. Good. Yeah, here are some technical data, but um, yeah, you can see all the technical data here also on our web page. So I'm not going here into detail of that. Um, because that is, um, yeah, no, not, not that interesting that I go to, into all of that. Um, the random dot projector. So we have that as a separate module, as a separate product that you can just plug on top or mount on top of um, the Arsa wizard. Um, why do we need a random dot projector? This is because stereo is a passive, um, yeah, by by definition, it's a, it's a passive uh, uh, algorithm or a passive measurement uh, uh, sensing technology. Um, but stereo vision, what it does is it compares parts of the image from the left and the right image, and it needs texture. If there is no texture, because you're looking at the white wall or a gray table or anything which is textureless, it cannot find the corresponding pixels, and then it can also not measure depths because it doesn't, uh, by default, it doesn't send out any information or light. Uh, yeah, it just uh, looks at what is there in the scene. And especially in uh, industrial applications, there is typically, um, yeah, there are untextured surfaces and so on, which we want to measure. So for that, we have the random dot projector, which just projects an artificial texture into the scene so that everything is textured. And then the result is much more dense, much more accurate, and um, yeah, also also much more robust. So that is a random dot projector for many applications. For most applications, actually, we sell it um, on top of the sensor, but it's not always needed. That's why it's a separate module. Next, we have a high-resolution stereo system with 12 megapixels. That's a lot. Um, so that is meant for large bins, or it was developed for large bins, so Euro pallet size bins with rather small parts of just a few centimeters where the sensor is mounted two to three meters away. And um, for that, you need that high resolution. And um, it also has a little bit higher baseline than our um, other um, RC Wizard sensors. Um, and it always comes with a random dot projector in the middle. So here you always have it included. Um, and yeah, as all of our products, uh, everything has IP54, so um, uh, as a protection class. You can operate the RC Viscore. Yeah, so the RC Viscore does not have any onboard computing, uh, unlike the RC Wizards. So you can operate it with um, either a library that you can download 
and do all the stereo matching and computing on your own computer. Yeah. So this library is called SGM Producer. You can download it for free for all RC Viz cores and all RC wizards that we have to just speed up computation with your own hardware. Or you can also um, plug it directly to an RC Cube that is basically our computer for doing not only stereo processing, but also running all the software modules on top. So all the picking modules that we provide. And um, yeah, that sensor is um, also as all of our sensors, it's it's calibrated. Calibration is actually stored on the on the cameras itself, and it's it's basically plug and play. The RC Cube that I just mentioned, um, that is a computer that, that uh, can be used for speeding up. Um, so here in the table, you can just see yeah the the old or current RC wizard. Um, yeah, with a depth image, what we have as a default um, in VGA resolution, you have about, yeah, almost two, three, uh, it can compute it with almost three frames a second, and the latency is about uh, 630 milliseconds from capturing the image until you have the, um, the, the disparity image in your in your computer. Um, with an RC cube, um, yeah, that's easily 25 frames a second and just 110 milliseconds uh, latency. And on the RC cube, you can plug in not only one sensor, but up to four RC wizards. And um, the chair just, um, yeah, the computing power here. And um, in that way, yeah, use it with more than one sensor. That's also shown on this slide here. And as I said before, um, you cannot only connect RC wizards, multiple RC wizards to an RC cube. You can also connect up to two RC viscos to a cube, so this 12 megapixel sensors. Um, and you can, um, as an option, also use the Basler Blaze. So there we have also um, uh, support for that, um, which is a time of flight camera that is also for some applications quite useful. Um, and we support all of that with our RC Cube. The software which is on the RC Cube is actually the same. I mean, it looks the same um, as on the RC Wizard. It has the same kind of interfaces and so on. Um, and uh, for using either a cube or a, a wizard directly, it's um, yeah for the user, um, the user doesn't see much difference, except that with a cube, they can operate four sensors. With an RC wizard, of course, it's just one sensor. Now it gets exciting. So this is our new RC wizard NG, next generation. From outside, it looks like the previous RC wizard. So you do not really see a difference um, from outside, but from inside, it's completely different. So the electronics is completely new, the camera boards, the camera chips, um, and also the onboard processing. Um, it's now based on the NVIDIA Jetson Orin, uh, which gives us much, much more power than we had before. And with that more power, we can provide more features, not only more speed, but also more features. So as our other sensors um, as well, um, it's an easy plug and play integration. Um, you do not need machine vision expertise and so on and so on. It's, it's very, very easy to, to use. Has the same um, interfaces that we are also providing on, um, yeah, basically in all our products. Um, so REST API, there is, uh, there is ROS support, there is OPC UA support, Genicam support and so on. Um, and uh, yeah, I would just mention two things which many customers asked us for. One is um, a hardware trigger for the RC Wizard, which is now available on the RC Wizard NG. So you can trigger it from outside um, when it should make images. We are also providing uh, the possibility of a soft synchronization of multiple um, RC Wizards NG. Uh, which are um, yeah, synchronized via PTP, so the precision time protocol for keeping the clocks um, aligned, basically. Um, so that is one thing. And um, yeah, the other thing is that we have um, a user space on board the RC Wizard NG, but I will explain that um, on, the, on the next slides. Um, here, first of all, a little bit the technical data. 
but that is now also online, so you can also look it up um, on our web page. Um, resolution has increased. Now we have 1.6 megapixel on board here. Um, the other data is pretty much more or less the same as we also had it um, uh, yeah, with the old RC wizard. Of course, the, um, the onboard computing is, uh, is much more powerful here. And you can also see that here in the, in the frame rates. So for the old RC wizard, I showed you uh, for VGA resolution, it's about um, yeah, almost three frames a second. Here for a little bit more than VGA resolution, we can actually run it with 16 frames a second and also with much lower latency for onboard computing, which reduces the need for having an additional computer if you need, yeah, if, if runtime and, 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 and latency is, is an issue. Um, yeah, what I just mentioned is um, the Docker space. So many customers asked us, uh, can I run my own software on your sensor because you have a smart sensor? With the old RC wizard, it was not possible because the computational resources and also the memory was just not enough. With the new RC wizard NG, we have enough power and we have enough memory. So we have eight gigabyte uh, onboard memory, which we can share. Um, and what we are providing here is um, yeah, a so-called Docker space. So customers can easily put their own software into a Docker container, upload it to our portainer interface that we have on our sensor and um, yeah, run it on our sensor. And um, this just saves them again, um, maybe another vision PC that is not needed anymore. Um, yeah, the interfaces for communicating from the Docker space into our software to our sensor are basically the same interfaces that we also have for the outside world. So um, REST API for all parameters and um, for images um, internally, we recommend not um, uh, GigaVision uh, because it has too much overhead for just communicating within one device. Um, so we are uh, recommending here a gRPC based interface, which is uh, pretty simple, lightweight. Um, we have programming examples for that. Um, so very easy to use. And um, yeah, before we only had this user space on the RC cube. So there it's still on the RC cube available. Um, and now we also have it on the RC wizard NG. So the software, when customers buy our um, RC wizards, um, they get a bunch of software for free on board. Um, and this software includes, of course, rectification, stereo matching, and so on. We also have um, a module for tech detection. So you can detect um, yeah, April tags, QR codes, and so on with onboard software, which just comes with every RC wizard. Um, we also provide, as I mentioned, this SGM producer that can be used for an RC Visco and or for an RC wizard. Um, that's always useful when um, yeah, the onboard processing is too slow, then you can just um, use this library. Uh, it's Genicam compatible, so you can plug it under any uh, Genicam um, software like also um, Halcon or, or other software packages. Um, and it just uses then the resources of your own computer, of your own vision PC to, um, to speed up that computation. Um, what we also have is a, a lot of calibration modules. So we have um, the stereo calibration module. So all our sensors come calibrated. Normally the calibration is not an issue, but um, yeah, if the sensor is dropped uh, or crashed or whatever, it might be that you ask yourself, hmm, is it still calibrated? And then you can just um, yeah, click on our web GUI. I show that also in a minute. Um, and uh, hold the calibration grid in front, and then the sensor says, yeah, everything is all right. Um, in the worst case, you can also redo the stereo calibration with the onboard software. We have also a self-calibration module that always checks if the calibration is OK, and it prints warnings into the log file if um, it finds issues, tries also to self-correct some of the issues if it finds some. Um, normally, this doesn't happen, but it's always a good feeling if some instance is checking it. 
Um, what call, uh, customers with robots always need is hand-eye calibration. So calibrating your sensor to a robot that is also um, for free available on board. And then you have a few other modules for um, controlling the, uh, the general purpose inputs, outputs, and so on. And at least for the old Arsa wizard, we had also navigation modules um, like uh, visual odometry and, and infusion with IMU data and so on and so on for customers that like to do navigation with their, with their sensor. Yeah, you do not need to be a vision expert. Um, we always got the feedback that um, the user interface is very intuitive. It's very easy to just plug in the sensor um, and, and, and play around with it. Um, you do not need to install any software on your own computer. You can just use a web browser um, and uh, connect it to our camera, and that's it. And then you can test and try out everything in the user interface. So I'm just going to show that briefly here with the system that I've connected. So in this case, we are actually on board an RC cube. You can see that here, but the interface looks almost the same with an RC wizard or with an Arcel Wizard NG. So um, yeah, it's it's uh, um, if you know one, then then you know the other as well. Um, yeah, on the dashboard, you just see with this RC cube, we have only connected one sensor. Of course, we could connect also multiple sensors. Um, you can see here the live camera images um, of the scene. Um, yeah, play around here with all the settings, like with exposure settings. You can see that it's now getting darker. We also, in our sensors, we have implemented um, high dynamic range mode, which is quite um, quite useful for um, scenes with challenging lighting. So if you have objects which are maybe reflecting, which are very bright at some spots, but other parts of your bin is very dark, then uh, this high dynamic range uh, combines multiple images with different exposure times and calculates an optimal image that you can see here. Um, and um, yeah, that's just one of the features that we have. Um, yeah, you can see here the depth image, just press acquire, and then you get here the, um, the live um, uh, yeah, depth or disparity image. Um, you can see here the confidence image. You can download all the data immediately with one click, um, play around with all that settings. So everything which is available uh, programmatically is also available here for playing around with the user interface. And as you can see, very um, intuitive. Yeah, these are all the, the picking modules um, that, um, yeah, as I say, I'm not going to talk about today because of a uh, matter of time. Um, but it's for basically detecting objects for uh, pick and place applications, um, for example, with, with robots. And um, yeah, and so on. So I could. I could explain a lot, but it's also for most customers, it's very easy to just explore the sensor by clicking here, by testing and so on. Um, yeah. Good, that's it for our user interface. Then, yeah, just maybe a few words, a few um, tips from my side um, for uh, application scenarios. So. Typical questions that I asked if somebody says, uh, hey, I have an application here, then um, the first question is from my side, what is a workspace? Um, so the workspace typically decides, the workspace and resolution decides which sensor is the best for you. Um, if you do not need to get closer than 50 centimeters to the closest object in your scene, then I would always recommend a sensor with a wider baseline because it's more accurate in the distance. Yeah, The sensor here, the 65, with a small baseline, that is meant if you need to get very close to objects, that's typically used if you, if you mount the sensor on, on a robot arm and go with that robot arm quite close to an object before grasping it or manipulating it or whatever, then the small sensor is quite useful. Otherwise, I would always recommend one with a wider baseline. Yeah, field of view is an issue, of course. Um, as I mentioned, we have a special version with a little bit smaller field of view. So here, the distance um, also to your uh, to your uh, workspace and, and the size of the workspace is an issue. Um, which sensor is a, is a is the best one? 
and then resolution. So for, for many, many applications, this 1.2 megapixel or 1.6 for the RC Wizard NG that we provide in the RC Wizard family is totally enough. It's totally sufficient. Um, but if you have small objects in higher distances, for example, three meter distance, Euro pellet size bin, few centimeter sized objects, then um, the high resolution RC Viscore would be very useful. Mounting position, yeah, static or on the robot arm, um, depends really on the application. Most customers have a static mounting, um, means that the sensor watches the scene while the robot is yeah, putting the, the previous part away. In this way, we can paralyze um, the uh, image processing and the work of the robot and just reduce the cycle time. So that is, um, What's, that's what most customers want and what most applications demand. But <coughs> mounting on the robot arm is equally possible and also um, uh, useful for, for many customers. Yeah, number of vision sensors in an application. So it's no problem to combine sensors in the same workspace or have um, in, a, in a cell uh, three or four sensors connected to uh, one RC cube. Um, we have, as I mentioned before, the user space, which can save cost because you do not need um, then an own vision PC. If you do not need, if you want or need to do some own uh, processing, or some customers also had uh, have, um, yeah, not 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 necessarily vision processing, but other uh, applications, and on top of our picking modules, um, and um, yeah, by utilizing our computing hardware in the RC Cube, in the RC Wizard next generation, um, you can just save your own hardware here. And the software licenses which are on the uh, on the cube, they are shared among all the uh, all the pipelines. So um, uh, instead of maybe buying four RC Wizards with four licenses, it can be cheaper to have one RC Cube with one license and then just connect four RC Wizards to it. Um, so that's just a matter of, um, yeah, of your application. Good. I think that is basically it, what I wanted to say today, Julia. And now my question is, um, are there any questions, Julia? Yeah, there are. So, um, Heiko, there were a couple of questions about the random dot projector. First being, how do I know that I actually need a random dot projector? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I would say, as I mentioned before, um, it's typically if you have parts which do not have an own texture, um, or if um, you have parts lying on the table, and it's also important to, to model the table, the surface of the table itself. So basically, the random dot projector provides an artificial texture uh, into the scene and um, it uh, in yeah in yeah in, in in most industrial applications I would recommend a random dot projector to be honest okay thank you and then um, can the projector also be used with an on arm mounted sensor within sorry what um, ah, like if I arm. mount the sensor on the arm, can I actually use a projector arm. with that? Yeah, yeah, of course you you can. Um, it, um, I mean, it's no problem. It can be always mounted. Uh, it can be also moved with the robot. We also have applications like that. Um, of course, what you need to consider is the sensor has a certain size, the projector has a certain size, so you need to mount it in a way that it doesn't. Um, yeah, it doesn't. It's, it's not a problem for the application itself. But um, it can also mount it, uh, be mounted on the robot, yes. OK. And then another question was, is a projector sufficient, or would additional ambient light further improve the result? Um, that depends a little bit on the light. I mean, <laughs> um, if you need additional ambient light or not, depends how much light do you have before, I mean, uh, how, how well is the scene illuminated, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so what is sometimes quite critical is if you have spotlights or light from, from one direction 
and you have reflective parts. So it also all, always depends on the surface structure of your parts. Yeah, If you have highly reflected parts, then ambient light helps a lot to reduce the reflections. Um, if you um, if you do not have really reflective parts, if everything is is nicely diff yeah diffusely reflective, then um, it's maybe not that much of an issue. So it depends a little bit on the application. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then another question is: um, Someone says I did not fully understand the accuracy value of dot two five pixels. Mm -hmm. So that's so how did you come to that value? Yeah, that's basically combination of um, the depth resolution that the stereo algorithm is or has as a property, and the calibration accuracy that we determined as a as a real measurement accuracy. So um, it's a statistical combination of both values. So um, if we are taking 0 0.2 pixel, in the worst case, calibration accuracy and um, yeah, 1 16th of a pixel um, resolution and combine that statistically, then we come up to this uh, 0 0.25 or quarter pixel um, accuracy. And that was also checked with, yeah, against some other measurement, laser uh, measurement devices in, in, in different distances. So we have double checked the values here. Yeah? We are coming to that from a theoretical uh, thinking, and then we, we, we double check the results. So. Okay, great. And then um, which interfaces can I use to do my own image processing with Robosceptions RCVS or RCVS Core? So we are providing um, a Gigavision Genicam interface. So that is an industrial standard um, that can be used by yeah, every library that um, supports Genicam or Gigavision. Um, and secondly, as a more lightweight interface, we now um, yeah, we have uh, the so-called GRPC interface. It's, it's based on the GRPC um uh, uh technology and it's just a simple definition how the how the images are transported we have examples for doing that on uh, github um, they are open source the examples um and yeah most of our client software actually on on github like also the ROS driver and so on it's all open source um so um you can just look it up and the grpc interface it's not only available on C++, so for um, uh, the example that we provide is uh, written C++, but uh, gRPC as a technology can be used in many other uh, languages as, as well. So um, you can easily derive your own, um, yeah, your own client in a in other computing language with with that definition. Okay, great. This actually perfectly suits the question that just came in now. <laughs> is it possible to run a, a Python application in the Docker container to process the image or point cloud? Yeah, it's possible. Okay, great. <laughs> and then, um, uh, oh wow, these are many, many questions. Um, do all the RC products come with a ROS API, including the new RC Wizard NG? I think with the NG, yep. it's yeah. Oh, it's yeah. Fit. Yeah. okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yes. it has the same. It has the same uh, interface, the same Genicam interface as the old RC Wizard. It's only the data comes faster, <laughs> and um, it it comes with a higher resolution. But uh, we have drivers for ROS one and ROS two, um, and they work with um, with the RC Cube, with all RC Wizards, and and so on. So. Okay. And then uh, can I use the RC Wizard without the Cube? Yes, you can in general, yes. meaning yes. can I use any other GPU to run them with my own algorithms connecting the cameras? Yes, it's basically the question with the SGM producer that I mentioned. So um, you can do the depth image processing on your own hardware, if you like, um, with the SGM producer that you can download for free. It only works with our products, but you can download it uh, um, just additionally. And um, this has a Genicam interface. So it's basically a, 
a producer in, in the uh, terminology of Genichem, it's a Genichem uh, or GenTL producer, which can be just, which can be used with our, uh, with the ROS drivers that we have. It can be used with um, the RC Genichem API, which is a C++ library that we also provide open source on GitHub. Um, and it can be used with any other Genichem compatible package. I mentioned Halcon, but there are many others. All right. So, um, and the last question for today. Um, are Roboception's cameras benchmarked in comparison with the other stereo sensors out there, like real sensor set two? <laughs> you want to comment well, on that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, some, uh, yeah, I mean, we are doing benchmarks, others are doing bench, uh, benchmarks. It, it always depends on the application, but of course, our sensor is best, yes. <laughs> well, great final words. Uh, thank you, Heike, so much for presenting today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, you will receive the slides for this presentation via email shortly, and then the recording of this presentation will be available on YouTube. Um, and I will put the link to the email with the slides. So thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And um, have a great afternoon and see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.